And uh, we continue talking trash here in this segment with Darren Grindel, CEO of Gold Metal, owners of Apple Valley Waste. Did I get that correct, Darren? You did. Awesome. And Mary Beth Blair, who does PR for Apple Valley Waste, basically the best way to put it, I suppose. Yeah. Right? Uh, Darren, I know you've heard a couple different uh, interviews along the way here to get to this point. And uh, as the uh, main trash haulers here in Berkeley County and holders of the Certificate of Convenience and Need, uh, did, I, did I have that correct? Necessity. Necessity. Thank you, Maria. Uh, you, you get the final say on this here, too. So welcome. Thanks so much for coming in. Happy to be here. Thank you. So you've heard a lot over the last few days. You, you heard the interview yesterday um, as well with Panhandle Dumpsters. Uh, I know there's a few things you wanted to clarify today so that you could get uh, uh, your truth out as well and uh, correct maybe a few things that you feel have been misrepresented. Well, I think some of them was addre were addressed before, and I did bring the actual decision because it mm -hmm. is important. There's a very robust process. Um, the administrative law judge was incredibly thorough oftentimes asking me questions to clarify some things that were there out of her responsibility versus just being responsive to testimony. Mm -hmm. um, so, and the decision itself provides a lot more detail than had shown up before. Now, Clint clarified a whole bunch of this just recently. Good. For example, I brought this and the administrative law judge was really clear why she didn't accept or didn't put into the record the 515 letters that were there. And it was not nearly a, just a decision of not wanting to include it. She said they weren't relevant after having been reviewed, right? And that we didn't have a chance to review them too. Now that's easy to make it sound nefarious by just saying, well, we don't know why this happened, but there was a reason. And so most of what I would have said is very similar to that. And I'll encourage people to get the facts themselves. What you'll find out is that things that are said on air are really different than things that are said under oath. Um, and I encourage people to get the facts themselves. Well, let's start first with Apple Valley Services, this area here. Do you feel like you're providing a good and consistent service to the, your customers here in the Eastern Panhandle? Absolutely. Nothing's perfect, and we endeavor to be better all the time, but this is an extraordinarily difficult business. And one of the things that we did enter into evidence was uh, examples of the kinds of complaints that were being made against Apple Valley are available easily online to find against Panhandle and any other service provider. It's a really difficult business to be perfect. And under oath, Drew said that, exactly that. You'll pick up somebody for two and a half years perfectly, you miss them for one week and they file a complaint. <laughs> And how many customers do you have, residential? Roughly 35,000 in wow. Berkeley and Jefferson. And that's net right now. Panhandle Dumpsters says they have 11, maybe 12,000 customers. I guess that's a fluid number day to day. It, yeah, and it's hard to verify. Mm -hmm. um, they, were, they had to produce financial reports, and it was difficult to correlate. You have a number of customers, and the amount you're charging them creates revenue, but their filings for taxes didn't seem. So it's not clear to me how many they actually do have or what they're actually charging them. But yes, they have a number, they've taken a number of customers from Apple Valley, that's absolutely a true statement. Why do you feel like you've lost those customers? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, and in all things, there's, nothing is perfectly simple. But when I showed up in 2000, Apple Valley hadn't requested a rate increase through the PSC for seven years, right? And that created some challenges. There were a whole bunch of other reasons why there were some challenges at Gold Medal Apple Valley, but not having requested or received a price increase was one of them. So what was the first thing that I did? request a price increase. And this is an incredibly thoughtful, thorough process as well, where the PSC reviews all of your costs and, and in order to justify a modest profit, which was about 6%, then they approve certain pricing levels. But that created a 17% price increase, which was a shock. And if you go back and look in the history about where Panhandle picked up our customers, it was primarily right there. And then they've been able to make that case about having a lower price by offering discounts or free services initially. And when somebody's got a fixed price and somebody else offers free service or discounted service, it's not hard to get people to jump over, even if there aren't service issues. And this is all well documented in the administrative law judge's hearing where she, or in her decision, where she talks about the fact that it is clear with the evidence that the majority of the Panhandle customers were attracted by lower prices or discounts that are not allowed under the PSC convenience of, uh, a certificate of convenience and necessity. 
Uh, what percentage of those do you think left because they didn't feel like the trash was being picked up consistently? There's no way I could answer that question. I just don't know. Bill Stubblefield. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Darren. Uh, your prices compared to Panhandle, what are they as of today? You know, it's interesting because I don't know, and we've asked, and Drew, is, Drew dodges a little bit about what is actual pricing, and ours is regulated, right? And so it's $33 and change for the basic trash service in in Berkeley, and then $5, I'm sorry, 29 for the trash service, and then 581 for the additional recycling service. And then there's a fuel surcharge added on top of that. Is that per month, per week? Per month, per for, month. for a weekly trash and recycling service. And Jefferson is bulked, right? And how many times a week is that, Darren? I'm sorry, in Berkeley, it's every other week. In Jefferson, it's weekly in okay. terms of the recycling. And it's a baked in price, it's 34 and change. In it's Jefferson. Week, weekly for the trash, every other week for recycling. In Berkeley and Jefferson, it's weekly. Yeah. Nope. You provide services outside of the eastern pan out. where else do you provide services during four different states right, so we're here in west virginia we we work in pennsylvania new jersey and maryland do you find the regulatory uh to be about the same each state oh it's wildly different <laughs> and west virginia would be more restrictive more uh, lenient or what so it's in the middle i would say that and in some places it has been interesting to hear people talk about the city of martinsburg so you'll find in a lot of very dense environments, the cities will just try to take it on themselves, right? Because actually, the more dense it is, the easier and the more stable it is, in which case it may be best for a taxpayer perspective for the city to provide those services on their own. When you get more rural or it's more diverse, then that those efficiencies are not as easy to predict or manage. So you'll see things separate. A good example actually is New Jersey, though. There's a lot of density there, and they, they push the decisions down to the town level, but it is all contracted. It is one provider who has a certain number of years to provide the service to, for everybody there, but people don't get a choice, right? So that's sort of fixed, full regulated environment. And then in most of our Pennsylvania markets, it's wide open competition. So better or worse is a question of what flavor of tea do you like, mm -hmm. right? And then there's a question of aligning the services based on what the community has decided is best for that community. So next up then, um, and I probably should have asked the other guy this, but um, is, there a, um, you know, is there a way for them um, to appeal the decision or are you in the throes mm -hmm. of this is just what it is now? So they had an opportunity to appeal, and okay. I don't remember the time period, but it's come and gone, and they chose not to. Okay. Okay. Joe? Well, I hurriedly read the decision here. <laughs> uh, and and uh, it's clear to me that the sole question before the ALJ was, are current services provided by Apple Valley adequate for the area? And she f clearly found that they are. So that is kind of the be-all and end-all of the hearing before the PSC. Uh, and I'm struck by the fact, and I, I'm going to pump you up here a little bit because this is a fact stated, and I imagine it was proven at the hearing, that your company has had nine complaints over a 10-year period so filed the before the PSC. Correct. Uh, to me, that's remarkable in, in, in terms of performance. Now, we can have an academic debate, however, about certificates of need and convenience uh, and whether they should be imposed in trash hauling services because I understand and, and I want you to verify this for me that West Virginia is one of just a maybe a couple states that has that requirement Two, two states okay and in fact you currently haul in Pennsylvania which which has no certificate requirement so your company's up there competing with other trash haulers in an unregulated area of the country, right? Correct. Now, what are your, what are your experiences in Pennsylvania versus West Virginia? Because what we heard from Mr. Hogben and others is that a certificate is really necessary because of the nature of the business. We want to make sure that outlying areas get services and they don't get gouged for pricing. Pennsylvania has outlying areas. Uh, Pennsylvania has rural counties. What is your experience? Once I pull back from an area that we can't properly afford, I have no more visibility in how they're picking up their trash, whether they're having open dump problems or people are burning it, I don't know. But I have pulled back from the areas that we can't profitably serve in Pennsylvania. So I can't answer the question. Um, uh, okay. It's very easy to determine what's profitable to serve and then to make the decision that this is not an appropriate use of my resources and we have trimmed off routes and entire areas there because it can't be served profitably. Well, that kind of answers the question. Yeah. You go without service or you figure right. another way out of dumping your trash. 
So the, so the argument is compelling then, is it not, Darren, that, that a certificate requirement in West Virginia assures or at least gives us a better chance of these outlying areas getting the services we need. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, if you, if you want to guarantee that there is service available to everywhere, it's hard to imagine doing it without some requirement <coughs> like the certificate of convenience. And so necessity. that begs the question, no. why doesn't all states have a certificate need? In fact, we're only one of two. I would think that all states would require this. It's a great question, and I don't have the facts to answer it. Somebody brought it up regarding the study. The one thing that I will tell you, in the markets that we're in, there's a question about the nature of the environment itself. And the unique nature about West Virginia is that you have rural communities right next door to ur more dense urban environments. And it's the disparity of the density that creates this complexity. And it may be that other places there's more space between them, and so you can have folks that are dedicated to pick it up in rural environments that have different sort of financial returns and there's a better market for those kinds of services in those areas it's not clear yeah but I, I don't think there's that much difference between West Virginia and the other states as well you have rural areas uh, right beside more urban areas so so I, I'm just curious why I, I see the value based upon this discussion I did not see it before the last two days the value of the certificate of needs and necessity or what it was called uh, a certificate of need is what I'm going to go with, uh, but uh, but I, I can see the value of it now, and I, so I would think that we're in a unique position for the folks for the protection of folks like myself, Maria, Mary Beth, and others. So uh, there are some other elements in the history of this, and I. I sp I'll give it as a history because I don't know some of the facts and exactly how they sit in other areas, but things have evolved regarding how the market is providing services. There were a lot of places where the larger companies would come in under franchise agreements and they'd have rights to both commercial and residential. Commercial is wildly more profitable than residential. That's a fact. Right. So um, in an environment, very often they would pick up the residential services as an opportunity to get in for the more profitable work on commercial. So in plenty of these other areas, it may be that they realize they're going to get a much lower return on what they're doing in residential. But that's OK because they have the opportunity for commercial. So even though it's not regulated specifically, the nature of the contracting provides a buffer against these outcomes. How does, Darren, how does your pricing then compare if the PSC is setting your, your price range, um, how does it compare in states like Pennsylvania and Virginia? Um, are you at the same level? Are you charging the same thing for customers here in this part of West Virginia as in, I don't know, Allentown, PA? Or? There, there are examples on all sides. Okay. Um, and it's going to be based on the cost of service in, okay. in the individual areas. There are places in New Jersey where we don't, it's up to $45 for weekly trash and, and recycling service. So the, the amounts that we have here are nowhere near the high end of it, but there are other that places yeah. where it's substantially cheaper because I'm pricing for a much uh, more dense market or an area that's closer to the places where we are located. I know another thing that came up yesterday in the interview yesterday, I believe it was, just that withdrew. Right, that they were denied by Apple Valley access to, you know, br when they pulled up, they said your trucks are no longer welcome. I think yes, I think we they had to do have, with Hagerstown. I, I, they were talking about a Hagerstown right. location. And so I just I think it would be a great opportunity again for Apple Valley just to shed some light on that you know situation. The facts and the letters that were out, the offer to them, you know, just so that the public does uh, understand. Darren, what do you have on that? This was Drew's accusation that when they uh, they had access in Hagerstown for a while, then all of a sudden they were told that their trucks were no longer welcome. It's just not true. Um, I have an email here, a series of emails to Drew um, and his partners offering them new contracted rates. This was as late as November 16th. It was actually the day that there was a conversation with the Berkeley County Solid Waste Authority, and we were all sort of online, and Drew yelled at me for lying. And I think, I, you don't tell me I'm lying if I've got paper, you know, and I can tell you exactly when and where we offer these things. So we do, Apple Valley owns a material recovery facility in Hagerstown where we take single stream recycling. It's a god-awful business. If we weren't in the business, would we get into it now? Probably not. One of the hard truths about this is that recycling is wildly important to communities and almost impossible to make money from a service and a hauling perspective. And we, as communities, have to figure out how to deal with that. 
how, if somebody can't make money providing the service, but it's valuable to the community because you don't have to put things in landfills and your costs are lower, you gotta figure out how you subsidize so that the community can achieve those ends. It's difficult to do. So there will be, this will fix itself, but we're not making any money at the recycling center, even charging people the rates that we offered for Drew and those guys. It's part of the investment in the overall opportunity to provide these services writ large to communities. So their trucks will be welcome at the right price, basically, is what that boils down to. Absolutely. He was given the opportunity to do it. It's easier for him to say, I don't have the opportunity. He has every legal right to do with recycling every single thing he's doing with trash. He just chooses not to because it costs a lot more. And this was in the decision as well the, the ALJ was able to point out the fact that some of the claims they were making just didn't hold water because of I, I believe Clint Hogman said it was the Harper decision other haulers are allowed to come into the county so long as they don't dump in West Virginia and I fail to see how that protects your certificate in terms of a business model because now they can cherry pick the more dense customers and you still are required to go to the furthest reaches of the county to provide service and these are your less profitable probably operating at a loss when diesel costs go to six bucks a gallon customers so how does them being denied certificate of need not do anything but harm you darren well the certificate of need or necessity sorry the, the, or the certificate of necessity component of this is a little different and a little more complicated um but Yes, it's odd, right, and somewhat inconsistent that Panhandle's market opportunity is based on a federal law loophole, if you will. I mean, at the end of the day, the federal law doesn't require the states to coordinate their disposal activity. It doesn't do that. It just says in the interest of interstate commerce that you one state can't preclude another state from doing this, but they don't help the states deal with the fact that, you know, the disposal issues and the rest of it. So it's an unfortunate reality, but it wasn't by design. This is the loophole that they're working in. And just because the panhandle has so many places that sit around the edges of it, it's an inconvenience that somebody's gonna have to figure out how to deal with. I didn't understand this at the beginning when I first showed up in 2000, I made an appointment with the PSA. I said, explain this to me. I have a certificate for providing this, but you don't enforce whether or not somebody else is doing it. And they're not an enforcement arm. You know, even if they wanted to, they, the cost associated with just verifying compliance is extraordinary. You know, one of the points that hasn't been brought up um, is that it is so much harder to do this consistently, safely, and compliantly well than just show up and pick up the trash, right? You know, if you look at, if people want to know really what's going on, anytime anybody wants to provide these services, just FOIA the Department of Environmental Protection and ask for all the information about Panhandle. You're going to see some things that horrify you. If I had the complaints about my company that have been made about Panhandle at the Department of Environmental Protection, I'd be fired instantly. Uh, go, let's go back to uh, what I was asking you a moment ago in regards to the certificate of necessity and convenience for trash hauling. I'm, I don't know the business like you know it, obviously. This is what you do. But based on that Harper decision, if I'm you, I'm going to that hearing for panhandle dumpsters and going, yes, give them the certificate because then I can compete on equal grounds with them because they've got to do everything I have to do. And right now, they don't. They can cherry pick. So equal grounds is the important part. You know, I, I'm willing to compete in any environment. We're pretty good at this. Um, but you have to be fully equal. I mean, you'd almost have to distribute the rural areas and force them to have those customers, not pick and choose as they come in, right? Because... The administrative law judge was clear. These people, acquire, Panhandle acquired all these customers by offering discounts and things you're not allowed to do, right? If they were forced to have answered the phone and, and gone to Paw Paw or some areas in Shannondale that are just as rural and difficult as some of those other areas closer to the ridge, they'd never have been able to do what they did. And in fact, they pulled out of some of those areas here. So just issuing them a, a certificate doesn't create an equal playing field. You'd have to redistribute all the difficult areas and everything else. So it was, in fact, a fair measure of competition. So how do you do that? Well, it seems like it could be overcome. But right now, I think you're at a disadvantage, aren't you? Because they don't have to go to the rural areas any longer. So one, I think that this is harder than they expected it to be. Um, yes, we are at a disadvantage for these kind of things, but um, I, I fundamentally believe that a bunch of the customers that went to Panhandle, if they knew what they were doing in terms of increasing costs to others and the rest of it, probably wouldn't have gone, especially now that prices are have more of a parity to them. So we believe that we can provide the services that people want to be a part of because it's part of a community here. 
right? Not everybody's chasing every penny here. Right? There were some things, there were some absolute truths to what they've said about us. It was harder to get in touch with us than it should have been. Right? This was the pandemic. We had old technology in the call center. There were a whole bunch of things that happened. I put a 17% price increase through. People called and they were angry and we didn't handle it well. We we're much better than we were then, but a lot of those folks left before we'd made any of those kinds of changes. So we do believe that we can provide the, the service regardless of what the decisions are around Harper, but it would be a lot easier to lower prices if ultimately we could get some of those customers back. Darren, you made a point a while ago that needs to be elaborated on. You said if, if you for your uh, Pan Am uh, dumpster, you'd find a stack of complaints that you, with you, you'd be fired. Uh, what were some of those complaints? Um, they're right here. Right. Well, no, 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 just what was just summarize. I just want you to know that I won't say anything that I can't prove. And when I'm bringing you facts, I will bring you the facts. So there are two major areas of complaints and they've addressed one of them, um, that they were, they were providing an unpermitted dump at their facility, right? They were storing trash. At least these were the allegations and you're not allowed to do that without permitting a transfer station. Now the DEP has backed off some of those complaints, but a lot of the other ones had to do with stormwater violations and the leaking of leachate or hydraulic fluid and those things. And I have to presume, in fact, I know that the only reason that they haven't been fined or there aren't still out ongoing issues here is that the enforcement of that compliance issue has shifted from the DEP to the local community and the local community hasn't really gotten set up yet for addressing the enforcement of those issues. Now that'd be the obviously under the county council what what part of the county council do you know? It's new and I wouldn't be able to tell you that now I just I was following up on the complaints and what happened to these things and the answer is is that the DEP is no longer the enforcement mechanism for stormwater violations associated with these sorts of things it will fall on the council but to my knowledge they haven't been able to set up an office for doing those kind of things. It takes a little time. Yeah, to that'd be under the sewer department then. Okay. Joe? Uh, I don't know if we have time, but can you explain what happened in Sorga? <laughs> we definitely don't have time. Um, <laughs> yeah, good, good call, Joe. <laughs> so we'll I, finish up here. So one, in Sorga is a big deal. Um, and partly because it's a it's a disposal opportunity that will change the cost of service for everyone. And it was cited by Drew yesterday during our conversation he mentioned Densorga effect being affected by this decision as well yes and in fact what he said about Ensorga was also not true right what they said was is that Ensorga supported them they had a letter uh, an employee of Ensorga supported the panhandle doing this she was not an officer did not represent the company um, writ large and then I had the actual chairman of the board of Renovair refute this and that was in the PSC's letter too you know as well so again there's more to all of this story associated with what's going on but in Sorka it Sorka is a cool technology poorly executed it wasn't financed the right way it was executed poorly a whole bunch of things are wrong there's a statement in the permit about in Sorga that they don't even need a market for the SRF solid recovered fuel which is what municipal solid waste turns into when you run it through this process and then you can burn it you know at the cement kiln um, there's a statement in the permit application that says you don't even to make it, need to make any money selling the SRF in order for this to be an economically viable entity, which is just patently untrue. And I don't know why you could ever make that statement based on what the, you know, the costs are in processing and everything else. So there were a whole bunch of things that were not true and there were a whole bunch of mistakes that were made, but we're very hopeful that we're going to be able to restore that. And we should pop out of sort of the legal mess here in the next 30 to 60 days and hopefully have some more clarity for everyone. Any idea why it was all such a quiet mystery when it suddenly closed Just and nobody closed. could talk? <laughs> um, yeah, when things go wrong, people tend to shut up, especially when, I mean, there were all sorts of or environmental problems. Um, it, it, look, there, some people should be in jail with how they left that. It's, that's just a true statement. There, there are criminal liability associated with the, man, the mismanagement of environmental issues, and at a scale that large, it was horrible. Um, so I, I can imagine once it started to go bad and you didn't have the financing to fix it, you're better off just zipping up and putting your head in the sand. Again, uh, it was a real mess from my understanding. Uh, were you part of the cleanup? We were and remain. Yeah. I mean, the key there being remain. Yeah. yeah. How much longer until that site is clean? Well, so we took out all of the high-risk stuff, right? It was almost 4,000 tons of garbage that was in there, 
right? It took a very long time to even figure out how you could safely do it. There's been a lot of damage to the plant from the fires and everything else, but we removed all of the primary risk. We were trying not to simply because I can't afford to do this. I'm not going to get reimbursed on it. And there's no guarantee that we're ultimately going to get reimbursed. But literally at one time I called Clint and I said, listen, we're good. The DEP said we've taken out enough. This should be fine. We're going to remove the 24 hour security and the entire thing. The biggest expense we had was the security. Mm -hmm. If they just left people there or left the lights on or something along the lines and fire suppression worked, it might have been OK. Um, but we had to pull that because it was so extraordinarily expensive. The next morning, the the biggest fire started again mm. despite having walked through and everybody else did it because trash when you leave it creates real big issues what percentage right now is the landfill in berkeley county in terms of capacity Ooh, that's good and i don't recall i had to remember this for the alj stuff that was there and clint would know off the top of his head um ballpark it, it's i think there's 10 years left I don't, so I don't know what that is as a percentage, but it's not a super long time. And this is one of the reasons that having alternatives like in Sorga will allow that to continue to serve the community for um, a longer period of is time. There, is there land adjacent to it that can be purchased to expand the landfill? Ooh, that's a great question too. I have no idea. Um, Another Clint question, I guess. Yes. I remember, and I'm sure um, several people in this room remember all the issues with the landfill in the 90s and yes. mm -hmm. you know at the end of the month you couldn't the, yeah. you know that was a big fat mess for sure Darren thank you so much for coming in today appreciate yeah. your time sir my pleasure thank you for holding the conversation Mary Breath Mary Breath Thanks. Mary Beth thank you for setting that up mm -hmm.